right, and we're going live. And the sun is bright out here. <laughs> All right, we are live. We are live. Hey, welcome everybody. This is Casey Church, pastor of Good Medicine Way. We're going to be, I'm meeting with you tonight on outdoors here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the uh, homeland of the, the Pueblo people. Uh, the land we're on right now is probably a, a cross between Sandia Pueblo and Isleta Pueblo, but uh, all of it is Pueblo land that we're acknowledging here, and we pay respect to that. Tonight, I'm going to uh, do our opening ceremony with a pipe ceremony. And you, it's going to be a unique way that I do this uh, because I, I usually don't like to be videotaped when I do a pipe ceremony. Uh, it's just my uh, my little quirk. Uh, that way, no one can share it anywhere. So what you're going to see tonight is uh, something that I thought of here a while ago. And I did it once for the symposium that we have, the Nate Symposium. And as you can see in back of me is my house and then the wall of my house. So you're gonna be able to see my silhouette there. So I'm gonna light the sage off screen, off screen here. I'm gonna light the sage and bless the pipe and it'll take a couple of minutes. And usually I do not say any words with my pipe ceremony. My belief is that God knows our, our heart, our needs, our prayers, even before we ask him. And, but he does like to have that communication with us. So one way of communicating, the pipe was given to us for that reason, so that we can have relationship with our Lord and use the pipe and recognizing that when we use it in a good way, that our prayers are ascending to heaven. So as I, as you pray there and I pray here, the, the, the tobacco that I put into the pipe is representing the prayers that we'll be sending up to heaven. So I will be stepping off screen. I will light the sage and you'll maybe see the smoke blow in front of the, the camera here. And then from there, I will bless the pipe and then off screen with my silhouette, you'll see me do the four directions prayer. And for my, my way of doing the pipe ceremony is I do the four directions. I do have earth and heaven and all those directions are directions that God is in. He's in the, the four directions. He's in the below me he's in above me and i believe in his son jesus christ so he's also in here so the seventh direction i always point to is to myself so with that i want to do this this evening our friend good friend karen is going to be talking with us tonight and sharing and i just want to do that because it's so beautiful out tonight and the sun is just at a point here that the silhouette will hit our our back wall here and I can kind of get ready for that time as we get ready for symposium as well. So I'm going to go into silence now and I will light the sage and do the ceremony for us.
Dear Lord, you know my heart, you know my life, and I'll try to carry this pipe in a good way and do this for our, our group tonight, our Good Medicine Way service tonight. We pray for Karen as she delivers a message with us. We honor the ground and land that we're on here. And we pray your blessing over our service tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our next section tonight, this week in Native America. This week in 1973, the Center for the History of the American Indian was opened in Chicago at the Newberry Library and uh, part of a, a new era that was being ushered in of getting good quality literature, you know, from tribal leaders uh, about Native Americans, you know, to counter the popular image, you know, all that was around was like the, the dime store Indian novels or, you know, Tonto and the Lone Ranger or something. So um, certainly a uh, good uh, collection. Uh, different, different natives have done um, graduate studies there. Uh, so it's a good quality library and, a, and a, as I said, a symbol of an era changing of getting good uh, quality native education. And next, we have a couple songs for you.
end. Creation Insights from Heather Jim. Hey guys, uh, thanks for singing. Um, so for today, Creation's Insights. I was thinking about um, babies because um, we have puppies that are grown and they're, for me, I'm overprotective and for Preston, it's like, just let them be puppies. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, I'm fighting against nature. You can't fight against nature. Just let the puppies be puppies. <laughs> um, and that's what um, we do sometimes with Creator. I think we try to change what we cannot change. Um, we can't really change a lot of nature like it said. We can help it grow. We can help it be shaped, but we can't change it. Um, there is destruction, but at the same time, uh, you can't really destroy what you couldn't, what you cannot make. And so that's like one of the insights that I had to today was that he doesn't change. And that's good because it's reflected in nature too. So that's what I have for tea today. Cool. Casey. <clears throat> and here's Casey with some announcements. Yes. Well, last night um, we had our Nate's academic meeting last night. And things are looking really good for the our new accreditation. Uh, officially, it will be given to us uh, in a little ceremony in June. But right now, we we are fully accredited as a seminary, 
and last night we had a, a 16 or so, I think there were 16 different uh, instructors and we're moving ahead by uh, different ones taking up some administrative roles. Uh, my friend uh, Damon Casello, who has done a lot of his research on black elk, is going to be heading up the coordination of the PhD program that we have. Sherry Russell is going to be stepping into doing administration for all the rest of the uh, programs that we have and the teachers. So it's really looking good as far as those things are happening. Uh, there are some grants out there that they mentioned to us that uh, we are possible to apply for. Uh, one organization, uh, a guy named Chris, is an instructor. He says that this organization has more money than they know what to do with. So that's a good thing. So we're I'm going to put in and try to get some money for us because we next year we are going to be hosting a field education program here at Good Medicine Way and we'll be taking in a couple of students for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, and helping them understand uh, the urban setting of Native, Native America, church planting, and also visiting a lot of the various churches in the area, those that are contextual and those that are not contextual, Native ministries. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I'd like you to, a prayer request and announcement Laura and I and the family are helping out one of our dear friends, the Abeta family, and their daughter is, uh, is doing her Kenata uh, puberty ceremony, and we're going to be over the next uh, week here, starting Wednesday morning, we'll be doing ceremony with them. Uh, lots in, there's a lot entailed in it. Uh, there's a thing called tying the hair ceremony, blessing of the medicine man, uh, stretching. It's called a stretching ceremony. And then they'll be doing an all night sing. The, the ladies will be putting together a, a, all the ingredients for a cake. And if you've never seen this kind of cake, it's called the underground cake. It's, it's probably about, <laughs> I would say, 40 pounds. And it's cooked underground, and it's pretty neat. So my Bajo Joni and I are going to be a part of the fire keepers for that event, and then the we'll pull that cake out of the ground and then uh, enjoy some of the underground cake as part of her ceremony. Uh, we did this same ceremony as a, as an urban version, we call it. So if anyone that you know lives in town but does not have a hogan to, I mean, a, a hogan like a, a traditional one, but we did ours in our home because wherever we are, the hogan is our home. And we, we did our ceremony with our four girls from our house and it, it went out very well. And we were able to transition and do a rite of passage ceremony for our daughters. And so that's going to be happening for the rest of this week going on and your prayers for that. And hopefully that someday that we can all take part in a ceremony with uh, someone else. Uh, it's a very unique experience. Uh, any other announcements that you know of? Anyone? I can uh, just remind about the Women's Circle. We're on uh, Wednesday nights at 7 Mountain Time. We're reading Thomas King's The Inconvenient Indian, and it's kind of like a Intro to Native American Studies 101 course uh, condensed. So if anyone wants to jump right into the middle of that, ladies, you're, you're welcome. Uh, Wednesday nights at 7. I guess another announcement, uh, we're in COVID, we're probably pretty close to be going into green. Uh, and when that happens, I'd like us to get ready so that we can do our yard sale at the church and do a fundraiser with uh, many items. And I keep getting items given to me for that event too. So we're going to have quite a few things happening there. And if um, you're able to help, that'd be great. Uh, a lot of good things are there. The church, uh, the University Heights members are also going to be contributing some items for our 
sale as well. And so that, that'll happen. I don't think we will do it until after the second week that we are in a green. That way, there's no problem with people around us. Uh, we would still keep social distance and wearing masks, even though, you know, my whole family, we are now all fully vaccinated now. And so that's, that's happening. So keep that in mind too, as we move forward. And we look forward to someday here, we're gonna be doing this uh, service at the uh, church itself in our new uh, place on the subfloor of the University Heights Church. So that's, that's all I have, guys. Thank you, Casey. Um, I'm gonna be reading scripture today. So let me see if I can screen share this. <clears throat> Looks like I have to do something else. Um, power and cleanse and heal. A great crowd of people followed when the creator sets free, Jesus, as he walked down from the mountainside. A man with a skin disease all over his body came up to the creator sets free. He humbled himself, bowed down, and pleaded with him. Honored one, if you want to, can you heal me? Can you heal and cleanse me? I want to, creator sets free. Says, mm, said as he reached out and touched a man. Tribal law says that anyone who touches anything unclean would also be unclean, in need of cleansing. The creator sets free, instead of becoming unclean himself, cleanse the man with his touch. Be clean, he added, and right away, the disease left the man and was clean. Creator sets free, instructed the man, tell no one, take mm, the uh, traditional uh, ceremony gift and show yourself to the holy man. Then have him perform the cleansing ceremony given by the lawgiver, drawn from the water, Moses. That this will show others that you have been healed and made ceremonially clean again. Faith from an, a head soldier. As Creator sets free, walked into the village of comfort, Capernaum. A head soldier from the people of iron, Romans, came up to him. Honored one, the head soldier begged. My household servant that I care deeply is lying in bed, unable to move in great pain. I will come to your house and heal him, creator sets free, told the man. But the head soldier, knowing the tribal traditions, told him, honored one, I'm not worth the trouble that is come, coming to my house will bring to you. If you will speak to the word, I will know my servant will be healed. For I am a man under orders with many soldiers underneath me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. And another one, come, and he comes. My servant, do what I say. Greater sets me was so amazed at this answer. He turned to the ones who were following him and said to them, I speak from my heart. I have never seen such great faith. Not even among the tribals, uh, tribes of wrestle with creator, Israel. He let his words sink deep into the hearts of the people listening. Then he said, listen closely, for I have told you that this man is only one of many who will come from four directions to sit in the general, in the great lodge and feast with our ancestors. They will sit down with many of, with father of many nations, Abraham, 
He made his laugh, Isaac, and he'll grab her, Jacob, in the land of Crater's good road from above. But the ones who were first born to walk the good road will be forced out onto the night. Out onto the darkness, they will howl with tears and grind with their teeth together in anger and frustration. Crater sets free, then turn to face the head soldier. Go home, he said to him. Your servant, your faith in and me has healed your servant. And right then, the heel, head soldier's servant was healed in the home of Stands on a Rock. Crater sets free, and his close, close followers came to the home of Stands on a Rock. Peter, the mother in law of Stands on a Rock, was sick in bed with, with a fever. And Crater sets free, saw her. He reached out and touched her hand. Right then, the fever left her. She felt so good. She got up and made a meal for them. Later that day, when the sun was going down, many who were tormented by evil spirits were brought to him. He spoke to the spirits, forced them out with a word, and healed the ones who were sick. All this was done to bring full meaning to the ancient prophecies spoken by greater will help us, Isaiah. He took upon himself our sickness and carried the weight of our diseases. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Let me pray for you, Darren. Darren, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to have Karen to be able to speak to us, use your words, bring us together and be able to have us be in calm and surrendering ourselves to you to learn the words of you and your perspective and the things you have Karen to teach us. Thank you. And Blessing the words of Karen. And in good name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Preston. Well, I'm Karen Heft. I'm speaking today from uh, Treaty 6 territory, one of the numbered treaties in Canada. Um, I live in Edmonton and it's um, sits on the uh, west part of Treaty 6, which is a very large. Um, area and it's the traditional gathering place and traveling route and home for many indigenous people including the Nehiwak, the Cree, the Tsutsna, the Nitspati, the Blackfoot, the Métis, the Nakoda Sioux, the Haudenosaunee, Iroquois, the Dene Samin, the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe or Soto um, and also the Inuit. Uh, I am a Salvation Army officer so I'm ordained clergy and have been for 34 years. Uh, so I've been around a while. So I was born and raised on <laughs> Treaty 4 territory uh, and uh, the land walking with the Nehiwak and the Anishinaabe in Saskatchewan. But I was served as an officer in the Arctic, so north of 60 for 15 years and that was on Treaty 11 and Treaty 8 land and there I walked with uh, many nations there, uh, the Klinshaw, the Yellow Knives Dene, the Sati Dene, the Gwich'in, the Decho Dene, the Dene Selene um, and the Inuit as well, Inuvlaktan uh, and then from all the regions across the Arctic. We'll talk a little bit about that. I also served in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is on Treaty 1 land and the heart of the Métis people. Uh, we then um, moved to Northern British Columbia and there we walked with uh, many nations uh, from the Northwest Coast, the Gitsan, the Niska, the Wet'suwet'en, the Nadliwet'en, the Shimshan, and here in Edmonton, I walk with many of my uh, friends who are Nehiwak and Métis. 
And so I um, have spent a lot of time uh, across the nation, a couple of years in Ontario, not very long, but uh, mainly in Anishinaabe, Ojibwe there. So I have walked, uh, I've been privileged to walk with many, many nations across uh, the country, of uh, the north part of Turtle Island. And um, so I come to you today to speak a bit about some of the things that I have learned um, and some of the things that challenged me. So one of the things I wanted to uh, look at, and I'm going to see if I can share my screen here so that you can see some pictures versus just me speaking at you. Uh, and so here, this is this is the Barren Lands. So this is, uh, I speak, uh, some of the stories I want to share are from the people who walk above the tree line. Um, and so if you've never been in this area, pictures are have uh, a thousand words. And so um, I wanted to show you some of the beauty of the North. And so, uh, yeah, so that's where I wanted to speak start. The verses I was, when I asked uh, what we were going to share from the scriptures today, um, I wanted to, th this is what, these are the words that sat with me and, and said, creator sets free was amazed at this answer. He turned to the ones who were following him and said to them, I speak from my heart. I have never seen such great faith, not even among the tribes of wrestles with creator. And then he said, listen closely for I tell you, that this man is only one of many who will come from the four directions to sit in the great lodge and feast of our ancestors. They will sit down with the father of many nations. He makes us laugh and heel grabber in the land of creator's good road from above. Those words, uh, this man is only one of many who will come from the four directions. This man was not one raised in the teachings of the tribes of wrestles with creator he wouldn't have sat in all of those teachings so as i was thinking of that um, i was raised in a christian home i was privileged to be raised um, understanding um, so much of the scriptures and sundays you know were a day that were filled with uh like all of the things that we would do as um part of the church and so every it had all of these things around it what you could do what you couldn't do and if anybody's been raised in the church you'll know there was lots of rules um, and even in the scriptures you'll see that there was lots of rules around what they knew as the sabbath and what we after um, christ's resurrection um, celebrated on sunday but we kept lots of those same things of what you could do, what you couldn't do, could you play? Um, you were, we were at church, we were doing all these things and we have all of these things built up around the Sabbath. And so this is, when I was in the North, this was something that uh, was challenged for me. And so first off to understand some of the North, here is a picture of Northern Canada and the Inuit, so you have different regions um, if you can see my mouse, you have the Inuvialuit, um, and then you have Nunavut, and then Nunavik is down here, the Nunziad, Nunatsi, no, I can't say it, Nunatsivut over on the far eastern side. And, um, and I lived in Yellowknife just in here. And so when uh, you're looking at this far north, uh, you're looking at the Inuit, often they were called the Eskimo, which meant people who eat raw meat or whale blubber, or um, it wasn't really a very nice name, um, but it was the name that the settlers called people. But Inuit means the people. Inuk would be the single person, so it'd be the people of the land. So um, this is the area, very, very large area of uh, of Canada and Turtle Island. So from Yellowknife, can you, if you can see my mouse, up to the tip of where Alert is, is the same as Yellowknife all the way to Mexico. So that's how vast this land is, is it's, it takes in all of the provinces and mainland US 
and it's that far north going up here. So it is a huge area. Most of this area up here is 1.3 million square miles. And so the people live very far apart and it's vast and there's not that many. Um, so you lived very much alone. One of the things about the Inuit is that they're above the tree line. So you'll see this line going across on, uh, so they, the Inuit people are different in that they are a stone and oil people because there was no wood. Um, so they don't, um, they would make their fires on a rock with oil and have very low flame. Um, so they lived mainly above the tree line and, and that's why they do beautiful stone carvings because everything was stone um, or bone for them. And, uh, but the people I want to talk about today really are the Copper Inuit that lived right in the center of Canada in Turtle Island, way up in the middle. And they actually, because they were in the middle and came inland in the summer to hunt, um, and then they were on the coastline for the winter season, when explorers came across the Northwest Passage, um, they were usually inland and so they were never seen and there was not much contact made. Whereas on the Beaufort Sea and the Alaska Sea and into the Beaufort Delta area and also on the East Coast, you would have had a lot of um, connection. On the West side, it would have been with the whalers coming up from California. On the East side, it would have been with the Vikings and lots of others. So you would have had a lot of contact, but in the center, um, the contact was very, very minimal. So in fact, it was, um, they would say that there was really not many uh, connections of any kind for well into the early 1900s. So this area, this is a picture a friend of mine took like two weeks ago. Um, and so, on his Facebook, some amazing shots. And so this would be the Central Arctic. The, the Kentamiyuk, the inhabitants of the middle that they would be called. And so are the Copper Inuit. And they had their own dialect. And, um, and because they were so far away, you, there's not just one dialect in, uh, in Nuktatuk um, because it is the land mass is very far apart. My friends lived in Bathurst Inlet, right at the bottom of this inlet, and they had really no Euro contact until 1913 to 1918 with the Canadian Arctic Expedition. I think this is what really struck me when I walked um, this journey was that they uh, were still we could we would be up there and we would see the stone fox traps because they didn't have metal they didn't um, have matches they used uh, the traditional knowledge to make fire um, there was no uh, age of reasoning no jesus no uh, like just no contact so they were a people that were living what i would consider an old testamental lifestyle um, in the 1900s. Uh, and so many of the elders uh, were, oops, just a second. Many of the elders, when we were there in the 90s, uh, were their parents would have been um, adults at this time of contact. And so there was people who were alive who were very, very young children, um, but their, their parents were people who re knew and understood what it meant to come in contact with Euro people and Euro thought and um, things that we, we don't even know a world without that thought. And so I, that was actually something that was really powerful for me to sit for 15 years with people who were only one, two generations removed from any um, Euro contact and uh, it was like mind blowing. And so uh, just taking time to understand that. So I'll show you another map here. This one 
uh, our friends lived here at Bathurst Inlet. The best maps you can find now are the ones that show you where all the minerals are, because when we were in the north, diamonds were discovered in northern Canada and everything went crazy. Um, and so there's a couple uh, diamond mines. There's Jericho. There's Acadi and Diavik down here. But our friends, we have friends who live at the end of Contoido Lake with no one else around um, and have lived there traditionally on the land um, for since, since they were young people um, and their families came together and they saw each other and said, oh, you look interesting. And they sent them off on the land to live together. And we would do our winter hunt um, down here at the bottom of this map, a tree line lodge. Um, and so we would go um, hunt caribou as the herds went walking by. Yellowknife is farther south than this. But this is the dividing line between the Northwest Territories see, and um, Nunavut now. So this is this is the central Arctic where um, our friends live very, very simply. Um, and very powerfully. Bathurst Inlet is a matriarch, a mother and her five sons and their wives came in from other places and they still live traditionally here at Bathurst Inlet. And so as I walked with the people um, who were, and then I, I met many, many others from across the North uh, and uh, I did group with um, guys who were serving time and heard their stories. And one of the things that always sunk into me was that there's no grocery stores in any of these places, yet the people um, survived. And, you know, that was foreign concept to me. And so these things that were, I wanted to just share a bit about tonight. I read this quote from Richard Wagamese. If you've never read any of Richard's books, they're really powerful, but I was reading one called One Drum and it says, the stories of my people are invasive. They sit in your consciousness after you hear them and they begin to sprout and grow despite your inability to grasp their full meaning. That's what makes them so power powerful. They inhabit you. And as time goes by, if you allow it, they become you. The teaching on Sabbath was not something anybody came out and said, hey, Karen, this is what we mean. Um, it was nothing like that. It was me reading the scriptures and watching a people live People live a way that um, most of us haven't seen for a long time in our world. And it was so powerful that I started to see the scriptures in just how they lived. So how does all this teach me about Sabbath? Uh, it all comes back to food. Like I said, no grocery stores. And so here you can see uh, this in the summer, the uh, which isn't very long in the north, uh, and the berries, you can see the caribou um, come. When the caribou herd goes by, it's uh, uh, hundreds, and they just keep going a line across. Uh, the fish that run, um, the birds that come along, uh, all of these things would contribute to what they believe the creator sends them for food. Um, they would not exist if the creator didn't send them food. Um, and sometimes uh, it would be a long time between food or when the fish ran and they would work hard to get their food when it came. But really, it was about trusting that you couldn't work hard enough to get your food. You really had to trust creator would send you food. Um, and we don't like I haven't heard that a whole lot in my life. I mean, we trust God, but we don't trust God for just food to eat. We trust grocery stores and all of our big chain stores to make sure that they have enough food to feed us. Um, and when we get separated from the land and from the giver of all good gifts, I think we lose what Sabbath is. And we use Sabbath as a day of rest, um, where we rest from all the things that we run around crazy doing. So that's what I grew up doing. You do everything crazy, you go to school all Monday to Friday, do everything on Saturday and Sunday, everybody would just crash and worship God and, and just do nothing. Um, but it really wasn't about a rhythm of how do we trust God to feed us. Um, and when you read through the scriptures and you realize that um, creator fed his nation 
for 40 years with no food in a desert, it starts making more sense. Um, and, um, and so across this vast barren land where you can't see anything, um, this rhythm of creation was set. And right from the beginning of the story, creator creates and then rests and we're called to do the same. And so what does that mean? How do we rest? And then it's given as one of the 10 commands that we are to um, remember the Sabbath. And so, and then as you go along, you realize that all the prophets say, one of the main things that the wrestles with um, creator's tribe says is that they always get the Sabbath wrong. And so the Sabbath keeps coming over and over and over again in scriptures. And, and then in the Levitical law, you have this sabbatical year, a Sabbath year. Um, and it's supposed to be a year where you don't plant crops, and you don't prune your vineyards, and you don't harvest. You just wait for creator to feed you. And, and it's like they never, ever really did a, sab a Sabbath year. It, and then you come up to the year of Jubilee. But every seven years, they were supposed to have a year where you don't put up food. You just wait for a creator to feed you. We know we think that's crazy. And actually, when my friends take sabbaticals, you plan your whole year and then you take it off. But you have to make sure you have all your resources so you can have a sabbatical year. Um, and that's not a Sabbath year. A Sabbath year is a whole year where you believe God's going to feed your family. Like, that's like in white culture that's crazy uh, that's like stupid <laughs> like, like and and so we can say we trust god but do we really believe god will feed our families if we don't work hard um, we call that in my culture a good work ethic where you work hard um and you know and jobs that people say are do you have a good work ethic and a sabbath is not about a good work ethic it's actually the opposite it's about a good trust ethic and this is what the Inuit started to teach me just by watching them, watching them um, every day, um, recognizing that they don't have big freezers, um, they don't have big fridges, and they can't stockpile food for a season. Um, most of the white people who went north um, ship in food for a year on the barges. Um, the, the people of the north don't do that. And they lived this rhythm that was so powerful. They didn't even know they were doing it. It's just what they always had done. And that reminded me of the guy in Matthew that we read this today, where he comes with this great faith and creator sets free, says, I haven't, I haven't seen this. I keep telling you guys to have this great faith, but I don't see it. And, um, and that's what I'm looking for. And people are going to come from the four directions to show you guys how to have faith. Even though you have all this knowledge, you don't really have this faith. And so this concept of waiting for the food, the berries to come, that they, the Inuit people did not plant gardens. Um, so they weren't farmers. They didn't pen in animals. They didn't wait for the babies to come and that the, they did not have herds that they kept. Um, the herds roamed free, but they believed that the herds would come. They believed that the fish would run, that the berries would grow and their trust in the one who had given them life, that they would sustain them. So instead of living a Sabbath, year every seven years they lived sabbath every day of every year and it blew my mind as i stopped to understand what sabbath was and so in a really quite a simple way to say that they had come along and were really sharing with me and with others if we wanted to see very simply that they would exist and they continue to exist in spite of how um, we tell them that they should get with 
program and come into this, you know, 20, uh, 21st century now and, uh, and understand that this is old fashioned or that there's something wrong with this and that they need to do it differently. Here's uh, just two weeks ago, uh, Sammy posted these pictures going out and getting water. So this is how they get their water. They go out, they cut the ice blocks and bring them back uh, to the house and so that they would have water. Um, I remember saying one time uh, when we were there, he says, uh, you white guys, you'd put a big, big cistern in and put a big water tap and put a big oil then they'd go to the diesel place to get their oil and that and um and then you'd sit all winter and go crazy and get depressed because you'd have nothing to do but we each day go get our water and get the fuel we need for today and then we have tea with each other and build community through the long winter months and we strengthen our family A different way uh, to understand but I think it was very powerful and it taught me to once again, to understand from the scriptures, what does it truly mean to trust? And what will that look like if we actually challenged our own worldview and went back to trusting the one who says, I am trustworthy. And on the Sabbath, you rest and trust me. Don't trust in your own ability to provide, but trust in that. So what would it be like if we trusted um, Creator to provide for us? How would that change when weekly we took time um, daily to believe that Creator has something good for us and wants to make sure we are, uh, are healthy and survive uh, through all things? So that was the simple lesson I had on what the Inuit taught me for uh, looking at Sabbath. And there is, once again, this was just a couple weeks ago, very far north. They, the snow will come off about mid-July for about six weeks. So there you go. That's my thoughts for tonight. If you have any questions, love to share. Thank you. That was yeah. very cool. Yeah, awesome. Very good. <laughs> Mars got a question. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it's more like a comment. You know, first of all, you know, I really want to thank you for this. This was a wonderful presentation. And what really was outstanding to me was that, oh, can you hear me okay? Okay. So what was really outstanding to me was, was when, when you talked about how you mentioned how within mainstream cultural, white mainstream culture or white American mainstream culture, or just white Western culture about how it would seem uh, just silly or not, or senseless for you to not earn your work, right? Versus what a scripture say about what does scripture say about Sabbath and what you, what you mentioned about trusting in the Lord to provide. And I think a lot of that comes from within the Western culture, wherein there is that strong emphasis, even in the church, there's the strong emphasis on God helps those who helps themselves, even though those words are not in scripture. Like there's not a Bible verse that says, that says God helps those who helps themselves, right? But rather the idea of that comes from verses like faith without works is dead. We find that in James and the different Proverbs where it talks about the benefits of that you receive from your own labor, right? So, but I think that if we really, if we really focused on just trusting in the Lord to provide instead of instead of us doing it ourselves, I really believe that the West would turn upside down because that really goes against the the culture. That really goes against learned behavior and teaching. You know. Mm -hmm.
Thanks. Um, I just want to say uh, they work really hard. You look at all those ice blocks and that takes a whole lot of work, um, but it's which is first because um, they could uh, work really hard, but if the animals don't come, then there's nothing to clean. So um, the, the work can be uh, long, but then they have tea and enjoy time too. So I think it was, it, it's that whole, um, so it's not, you know, and the scriptures hold them in tension and it's which one do you put first? I think that was really the big thing is which one do you put first? Do we put our work first so then we can have time to rest or do we put our um, trust in creator? So I think I changed the word of Sabbath to trust versus our Western concept of rest, which is much more about vacation, laid back and not rest. I rest because I can trust. Like there's a difference in that kind of word. And, um, and I think in the Matthew chapter it, um, where the, the soldier comes and says, I just believe you can do it. Like, like, I just believe you can do it. That's what, you know, when Preston read that, like, you can do it, like, so do it. <laughs> um, and it's sort of, it's, it's a deep thing that you, you, you have to really work at that and not trust in our own strengths to do it. Thanks, Namar. How do we, how do you, evangelize this group or do you evangelize this group if they trust that God is going to provide them that it is only uh, belief in Jesus Christ death on a cross that's going to get them to heaven even though they live in Old Testament way of life do we are we obligated still to bring them uh, faith in Christ so interesting um, one of the books Igloo dwellers were my church, might be backwards. Uh, Jack, John Sperry was um, a good friend of ours. He was an English bishop and uh, he went up into this area and in, in, in actually helped translate scripture back in the 50s. And he said that they were really open to understanding a God of love and not the fears of a lot of the things that had been part of that. He talked about that some shamans were good and some weren't. Just, I would say that's like some preachers are good and some aren't. Um, some are selfish and self-centered and some are loving and giving. And same with many across uh, the North. Uh, they weren't, not everyone was evil. They most were waiting for the black robes to come uh, to give them the rest of the message. So they were pre-contact, they were pre-Jesus, but they were waiting for that message of love. But we tended to come with a message of do it my way. And we didn't come. I think the travesty that I've always said after being in the North was we had this amazing group of people who were um, on Turtle Island, were Canadian citizens, and we didn't listen to them. We let them die and not have this amazing knowledge of, of, of 3,000 years removed. And we didn't sit and listen we we called them uncivilized we called them backwards we called them all these other things instead of sitting at their feet and hearing their stories again so now we're hearing them through their children and their grandchildren and so they were um bishop sperry would say they were very open to the message of love they are very open to the message of uh of uh, jesus um, though, um, when I was doing group, I remember one guy, a big guy who was, uh, whenever we said the name of God, he'd throw his book across the room, but he always wanted me to sing amazing grace. Uh, so, and so I said, take the God of amazing grace. Don't take whatever this other God that was not a very nice person. Um, and so, uh, and then he could get past that. So the God that they were given, the Jesus that they were given, um, was not a nice person. Um, was, and so the journey of helping them find the creator um, and the one who has sustained them uh, and that God of love, I think, is, is, a, is a deeper journey than, uh, sadly, the Jesus that they were given um, in residential school um, where they were uh, stripped, where many were taken from the north with tuberculosis and never returned. Um, they were never told um, 
when their children died down south or when their elders died down south um, when they were removed um, for TB and all kinds of other things. So contact, and it's been a very short contact. So those stories are very, very real. They're not like a long time ago. Those are in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and so I walked with many men. We ran a halfway house, so I listened to hundreds of men's stories um, who were in jail for violent crimes and trying to help them find a space for their anger so that they could continue on, um, be strong elders as they grew up. Uh, so they were, they were quite open to hear um, creator and land stories. So the healing will come from the land, I believe. Well, another question, as an Old Testament kind of uh, lifestyle and that, did they have a way of worshiping the God that they knew and understood? Um, by the by, the time I came along, most of them had been in residential school, their elders. And so um, once again, they would have seen um, much of, like they're almost all Anglican. So the Anglicans went across with the Inuit people. So um, Church of England, uh, uh, what's that, Episcopalian in, uh, in the US. Um, and so they, they gravitated to that really easy. They, they were very much um, uh, creator people and spirit people, people who understood uh, that they have some of their legends that would help them. And so sometimes we don't understand those legends, uh, the jigaboo on the ice, because um, if your kids got out of the igloo, you didn't want them to go on the ice because they would usually die. And so they had lots of things that would help them not go out of the igloo and not go out um, from uh, the out onto the ice floes. And so, uh, you know, just like we would have things that would try to keep them in their space. Um, but like any culture, there was the, the good and the bad. Uh, Artanajwak is a movie you can find online and it talks about, it was filmed very much uh, in, in very traditional Inuit and looking at justice issues and how community can work together. And um, Zach, I can't remember his last name from Iglulik, filmed it. So if you wanted to watch something on restorative justice in very traditional Inuit ways, I'd watch The Fast Runner. It won an Academy Award um, for Inuit life. Mm -hmm. yep. but deeply spiritual people. Anyone else got a comment or question? How many are ready to move up there and do ministry? <laughs> God like the cold. Yep, not many of us. Live. We like our comfort of our cities, don't we? I hate cold. Um, Al likes cold, so Al always says God likes him more than me. But um, so because <laughs> I'm always in places that are cold. But that's okay. Uh, you wear fur. Um, they taught me lots about fur. If you wear um, wolf or wolverine around your face. You don't have to wear a scarf because wolf and wolverine repel wind. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I Amazing. Remember, I remember you told me that. Yeah. 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 Like you don't need to know that if you're in a warm place, but let me tell you when you're in a cold place, really good to know. <laughs> yeah. Out here we do everything before 11 and then we siesta and then pick it up after five o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do everything in the summer and then they siesta all winter. <laughs> well, that's amazing. So, very, very interesting, Karen. And I, you know, I spent some time in Canada, and, you know, and then went with Jonathan to Alaska to to do carry the cure. And it's just amazing the the different world that we live in. Uh, you know, here I've been out here in Albuquerque now, twenty one years. And it's just so used to the uh, the weather now. But when I went up to Alaska, uh, 40 below almost the whole time I was there, uh, I was cold. <laughs> and uh, it takes it takes strong, dedicated people to uh, find ways to to minister. And I I wish we didn't have the problem of the bad 
way that Christianity came to indigenous peoples. It's, I think this Satan won out there by using, using people with styles of ministry that just didn't connect with people rather than taking the time to listen to them and then start with the God that they already know and then work out from that. But we bring the God that we know and we plop it right on them and want them to adjust to us. And I pray that Good Medicine Way will be a transition to a place where uh, people can see that God can be glorified and we can learn a new way of worshiping because I really have a heart for the people of Albuquerque. Uh, someone had said that out here in the Southwest, only one in 10 have a relationship, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, but nine of 10 have had a bad experience with Christianity. And we have a lot to work with to, to try to turn things around. But I think we need to, you know, march ahead and just keep doing what we believe we can do with the time that God gives us here on earth. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, since you brought up restorative justice, because that's like a big thing for me. Um, when you were talking, I just I found it really interesting just really thinking about the whole trust versus work dynamic and like how true that really is that um you know even when we when we talk about oh we trust the lord like oh we trust that god will give me a good job so that i can provide for myself but we don't really trust that like god is going to provide um you know not in any kind of meaningful way i think sometimes we have our moments where we do but but i think that that idea of like work is so ingrained in kind of the Eurocentric um, culture that, you know, it's really hard for us to understand this idea of trust. And I was really trying to kind of wrap my head around that. And, um, and that did remind me of like uh, the ideas of restorative justice because um, Rupert Ross, who was kind of one of the magistrates in Canada who kind of started the restorative justice movement, but that, that started all with his work uh, with the Ojibwe and um, and because they were, you know, they would have these really bad, you know, re recidivism rates with crime and stuff. And, uh, and it, with this one village and I believe it was in hollow water that he was uh, working with. And some of the grandmothers from the village were like, Hey, you know what, what if we tried to do it? the way that our traditions say to do it, which was really kind of what restorative justice um, became to be built on. And and in his book, uh, Rupert Ross, you know, he was really taken by the idea. And so he like kind of brought it to his higher ups. And they were like, oh, well, yeah, you can kind of try it out on like the misdemeanors and like the, the light stuff and whatever. And he brought that idea back to the the grannies and, and and they were like what are you talking about like obviously your way does not work like our communities have been destroyed because of the way you try to bring law and justice and they were like no we we have to use it on the big crimes and on the bad crimes because that's where the need is most and you know and they basically made the case that that obviously the Canadian law and justice system was not working in their community. And so eventually the, the magistrates relented and were like, well, whatever, it can't get worse. So, you know, fine, if you want to do that, you know, but don't blame us if it all goes bad, you know. And of course, then it became like this amazing um, story of restoration in the, in the community. And they, you know, that was kind of the model upon which like restorative justice in Canada was was built on. And so that was, yeah, it was reminding me of that, and especially how you were talking about how there was just all this, you know, eons and centuries of, of knowledge that we just neglected. And 
and how that you see that in the, in the criminal system where they were trying to bring this sort of European model of, of penal criminology and it was not working. And when they listened to the traditional ways, it made this huge difference. And then they even started applying that in non-Indigenous cases because it, it, it worked so well. Um, and so that, I was thinking about that when you were talking about the trust and the work and like, wow, how, like how a radical of an idea that would be for, for Eurocentric people to really try to trust God in that way. You know, because even like when we go out on the land, you know, so to speak, we're like cultivating the land. We're fixing things. We're like, we don't just like trust that the land will provide. We don't trust that God will provide through the land. So even when we go to try to have like our Sabbath moments, you know, it's, it has all this preparation and work around it. So we're not, it's not like you were talking about, like it's not a real sense of trust. So I was really trying to wrap my head around like, man, how could I even, like, could I as a white person from the status quo, you know, raised with this work ethic, like, I don't even know, like, do I even know how to trust? Like it was like, it's kind of like this mind blowing thing when you really try to wrap your head around it. And it makes me feel like, yeah, that's what we really need to have these relationships uh, between indigenous people and white people because we're really handicapped as white people, but we don't we don't really want to acknowledge that and how much we have to learn from indigenous people. But anyway, that was all the things rattling around my head while you were talking. So, so Brian, that's why I started with uh, Richard Wagamese's quote, uh, it has to sit for a long time and it sort of sneaks up on you. Because um, once again, my friends would be uh, who, 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 as I watched them, they weren't trying to teach me some big theological concept. Um, they weren't trying to do any of that. They were just living. They were just doing their thing that they have done for centuries. And, and even restorative justice, that's like, we'll have to do another one on that. But yeah, like that whole idea that, that we would say uh, Rupert Ross started this. Well, he didn't start anything. And in fact, we still screw it up because we have to take it through our white lens to get back to circle. Um, and so uh, restorative justice just really says you restore or else you send people out to their death. So in an Inuit context, the, you were so close. Like if you sent somebody out of community, they died. When we sent people, when we send people to jail, they die from within. They socially die, and we don't understand that. Um, so you have to restore, or else you, or else you have the death penalty. That's it. Like there is nothing else when you actually realize that, and then, then you stop and say, how do we restore? Not should we or shouldn't we restore, but it's it's how do we do this? Um, and it's a it's a different starting point and I think so there was so many I mean there's so many other lessons that they taught me but Sabbath was the easiest one to at least because it's one of the Ten Commandments like we got to do this and we don't in the church we do it we spend our whole time talking about Sundays and worship and everything and I think we do it really wrong because it's still about us and not about trust and just this basic built-in creation relationship that creator wants to have with us and says do you really trust me? And wow, if we as his people could say, yes, we do. Like that soldier saying, my child's dying, I trust you. Um, and um, Matthew records, they'll come from the four directions to show us the way um, that we would listen and hear the words of others will bless us all and make our world a better place. Thanks for allowing me to share, guys. <clears throat> yeah, it, it was very interesting too, for, because when I got to hear Brian talk about like decolonization and everything, it made me understand like, oh my God, like how native thought and native process has been so colonized, being like, we have to be able to um, store and do this and have my food storage and everything. Um, we can say, we can look back at Cotton Chocolate Canyon and say there's food storage there, that our people had some type of food storage, but it's still going on trust, understanding that we need it, but we don't know if we're gonna need it for planting next year, or if we're gonna need it to eat in the following year. That's depending on what God has given 
to us and living day by day saying, uh, this is for us to use, not today, but to use within in a period of time. And that helps me understand why we have big things of like drying out food and having smoke houses and learning all those things. But it's so hard that it's learning that how much being stripped away from our land or being removed and but being a lucky part of that is being put back on the land that was given to us. But a lot of it has been damaged by the burnings and by the the overgrown and the bringing different types of uh, plants that were not supposed to be here because they the roots are over taking too much water from other plants. And which takes me to the three sisters, like beans and um, build nitrogen for corn to, to grow and it and goes in a big old cycle to help each other. So I'm just like, we knew God was telling us these things. We had the stories, we had the reasons. We just didn't need the scientific background. But now that we have the scientific background, it just shows how much and more intelligent native people were because we just trusted God. Thanks. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh, we look forward to asking you again in the future here to give, maybe give us a, a talk on the restorative justice part there. I think you, you're You've been at it a long time here, and I think you've got a lot of wealth of knowledge from your work with the uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada that uh, we can learn from, too. So thank you. So what do we got? We got a song now and a closing? Yeah, I think so. So we're going to do River of Life, which is about things coming from Creator. So let me get that going here.
You want to close this out, Heather? Thank you, Karen, for speaking about the Sabbath and our trust with the Creator. Um, so we just thank you guys for um, yeah, just for showing up today at six. It's always a blessing to see your faces on Zoom, and it's always good to hear from people and to gain knowledge from other tribes and cultures to see what their creations, their their insights for Creator is too. So. Thank you, Karen, and God bless you guys. Um, trust in the Lord, and hope you have a good Sabbath this week. So, I'm good with this way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Right. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Thanks, Larry, for coming on board with us tonight. Good night. Your drawing face. <laughs> <laughs> That's my friend from Virginia. Ah, oh, very good. All right. See everybody next week. Bye. See you.